Thank you all very much for joining us this morning for what I'm sure is going to be a fantastic event on foreign direct investment screening regimes being introduced and updated around the world. Um, we have an incredible um, um, keynote speaker as well as a panel to share their views. Um, with respect to FDI and investment screening regimes, unlike the first iteration of FDI screening regimes in the 1990s and 2000s, new rules are no longer solely focused just on investments in kind of the traditional military technologies. Today, many countries are concerned with foreign direct investments and so-called, and foreign investments and so-called dual use technologies, critical technologies, real estate and infrastructure. And as the definition of what qualifies as national security has continued to broaden, and concerns about which foreign investments are questionable, existing investment regimes have been overhauled. The US has been at the forefront of this effort. The US regulations, which fully implement the FIRMA, which went into effect, went into effect earlier this month, FIRMA, as many of you know, expands CFIUS's oversight considerably to cover, among other things, non-controlling investments in US businesses that develop critical technologies or critical infrastructure or collect sensitive per personal data of citizens. But the US is not alone. Japan has also tightened its oversight of foreign investment through a new law passed last year, and it's now finalizing regulations to implement that law coming into effect this spring. And Europe has also been busy in this area. European ministers approved a foreign direct investment screening framework last March, and many member states, including the UK, Germany, and France, among others, have put into place their own screening regimes in recent years. And several other countries are broadening their investment rules to cover more than traditional national security concerns. Australia now screens investments, for example, that might affect the national interest. All in all, the OECD says that at least 24 countries, accounting for 56% of worldwide foreign direct investment, have some type of foreign investment screening mechanisms in place. And this morning, we're going to take a deeper dive into all of this. We're going to look at questions such as, how much do these different screening regimes have in common? Where do they differ? How much international consultation, coordination, and cooperation exists in this space? And looking ahead, what are the prospects for countries working together more closely? And what's the best venue for doing so? And to address all of these questions, we could not have a more distinguished group of speakers. You have their bios on your seat, so I'm not going to go into any detail. But first up, we are honored to have Assistant Secretary Thomas Fetto with us, who serves as the US Treasury Department's Assistant Secretary of Investment Security. In this capacity, he oversees the department's work on CFIUS, and under his leadership, the new firmer regulations were developed and issued recently. Assistant Secretary Fetto is the first official to hold this position, which, which was created in 2018 as part of the major bipartisan reforms that expanded the authority of CFIUS. He has a long and distinguished background in the Treasury Department, in a law firm, and he also served as an officer in the US Navy. So we are grateful for Assistant Secretary Fetto joining us this morning and providing the administration's perspective on these important issues. Following his remarks, he will take a few questions and then will be followed by a panel of experts. So, so please join me in welcoming Assistant Secretary Thomas Fetto to the podium. Good morning. It's great to see some uh, familiar faces in the crowd, some old friends, and it's my pleasure and distinction to, uh, to be with you this morning. Um, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to kick off this event. I'd like to talk with you about protecting national security through investment screening. In particular, protecting critical and emerging technologies, critical infrastructure, and sensitive data. 
and provide you some perspective on how the United States is facing these challenges and how our allies and partners can work with us to protect this vitally important intellectual property, infrastructure, and data. As many of you know, Treasury chairs the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS, which is directed by statute to protect national security by reviewing certain foreign investments into U.S. businesses and certain real estate transactions. In looking at the particular facts and circumstances of a given transaction, the committee's governing law directs it to analyze the threat, vulnerability, and consequences of a transaction in order to assess the effects of U.S. national security and, if necessary, take action to address the risk arising from that transaction. CFIUS's exclusive focus is national security, and it executes this targeted mission while maintaining America's open investment environment. During CFIUS's nearly 40 years, the United States has remained a preeminent destination for foreign investment, investment that is essential to the growth and vitality of America's economy and which represents a significant part of the U.S. economic landscape. According to the Commerce Department, there was over $4.3 trillion of FDI in the United States in 2018, and as of 2017, majority foreign-owned firms in the U.S. exported goods worth $383 billion and employed 7.4 million Americans. However, some foreign investment can pose national security risks. As we enter the new decade, the United States and its partners face accelerating technological change and highly complex national security challenges. While America's military remains the most powerful in the world, and we lead in scientific and technological innovation, the advantages that have been instrumental in maintaining our position and protecting our interests and those of our allies could be at risk. As a former submariner, uh, this is near and dear to my heart, understanding how critical technology can impact the warfighter and making sure we have that technical edge. Over the next five to 10 years, rapidly developing technologies in fields like machine learning, quantum computing, autonomous vehicles, robotics, and biotech are likely to dramatically affect both our way of life and our national security. Some experts believe that these technologies will transform contemporary military concepts and capabilities and bring major changes in the character and conduct of war. The way the United States and our allies and partners develop, fund, operationalize, and protect these innovations will impact our future military advantage and our security. The rapidly growing field of artificial intelligence we hear about all the time illustrates the challenges that new technologies pose for national security. AI includes other technologies such as machine learning, autonomous systems, robotics, biometrics, swarm intelligence. If you don't know what swarm intelligence is, it's mind-blowing. You can look it up on, on the web and see these videos, and it's just incredible. And so uh, it's going to transform nearly every area of our lives. AI has the potential to improve health care, increase productivity, and create business opportunities that we're only beginning to imagine. However, it also portends an equally significant set of challenges and opportunities for U.S. and allied national security. AI-related technologies are being incorporated into a range of military applications. Autonomous weapon systems will offer obvious advantages, reducing the risk of injury or death to the warfighter. AI could also better inform decision-making during the fog of war, increase the speed and scale of military action, or allow robotic swarms to conduct new types of missions. And because AI and data are inextricably linked, the collection of that data and access to it has obvious potential national security implications. Another emerging technology with national security significance is quantum computing. Quantum-related technologies hold remarkable potential for impacting the battlefield. <clears throat> Excuse me. Quantum sensors will likely be among the first applications of quantum science deployed on the front lines, capable of detecting the displacement of air around an aircraft or water around a submarine. Ubiquitous sensors will generate exponentially greater quantities of data, 
which will further drive the development and deployment of AI. In this field as well, it is crucial that the United States and its allies maintain the edge. It should be apparent with just these two examples that rapidly developing technologies will transform the world, our world, and the United States must maintain its technological leadership to ensure that its citizens can, with security, maintain their way of life. However, unlike the past, when many advanced technologies were developed to support the needs of U.S. government agencies, today the vast majority of technology innovation is being driven by consumer demand, which means that commercially developed technologies relevant to national security are more accessible to state competitors and non-state actors through seemingly benign commercial investments. The fact is, this access risks eroding the technological leadership that the United States and our allies have grown accustomed to. Others want to be the leader and are actively working to be at the forefront. For example, in 2017, Beijing published its plan to achieve global leadership in AI development by 2030. So within this complex national security landscape, facing the challenges of protecting new and critical technologies requires vigilance strong and effective tools, and adequate resources. CFIUS is one of those tools because foreign direct investment represents one avenue that foreign states can use to gain access to, for example, key know-how, non-public technical information, or sensitive data that could be used to harm U.S. national security. And as the national security landscape evo has evolved, so has CFIUS. As many of you may be aware, and as Wendy uh, referred to, last month the Department of the Treasury published new rules mandated by the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act of 2018, or FIRMA. FIRMA is a generational update and the first expansion of CFIUS's jurisdiction in three decades. These rules took effect this month. In expanding CFIUS's jurisdiction, FIRMA recognizes that the nature of investments that could pose risks to national security has changed. FIRMA broadens the committee's jurisdiction to cover certain non-controlling but non-passive foreign investments into U.S. businesses involving that critical technology, critical infrastructure, and sensitive data, recognizing that non-controlling transactions in these sectors could raise national security concerns. Today, for example, a minority foreign investment in a Silicon Valley startup might raise national security concerns on par with an aerospace company's merger with a foreign acquirer. The United States obviously is not the only place where governments and investors need to think or think differently about the national security effects of inbound foreign investment. Recognizing similar risks, many countries are strengthening their investment review regimes or establishing a regime for the first time. And this brings me to a key point that I'd like to leave with you today. As techno technological change uh, accelerates, closer cooperation and coordination among allied and partner governments is necessary to protect our collective national security. Visualize the squeezing of a balloon. It can help to understand the importance for America's allies to establish strong national security related investment review mechanisms. The United States will effectively exercise its longstanding jurisdiction to review control transactions and its new jurisdiction under FIRMA. And so it's critical, therefore, that our allies and partners take similar action to avoid the risk of adversaries using investments in their countries to acquire comparable advanced and new technologies. For this reason, Treasury is working closely with our allies and partners to ensure multilateral cooperation on investment screening. Treasury is leading numerous CFIUS engagements with our Asian and European partners. We share an interest with our partners in ensuring effective investment security and are focused on achieving tangible outcomes. For example, next month, we're meeting with Japan and the European Union to benchmark best practices and trends in foreign direct investment <coughs> review. This effort will focus on investment screening of sensitive technology. FIRMA recognizes that our national security is linked to the security of our closest allies and partners. With increasingly globalized supply chains, many of the most challenging national security threats posed by certain foreign investments are transnational in nature. So it's essential 
to our national security that our allies develop and maintain effective investment security review mechanisms and processes. Over roughly the last year, a number of allies and partners have enacted reforms or announced plans to enact reforms of their investment screening tools. These welcome steps reflect and recognize the continued risk posed by certain sensitive technology acquisitions. Our collective security depends on the ability to address these risks together. The United States is proud to be one of the world's most open investment environments. FDI is a vital source of economic growth and job creation, and we will remain one of the best destinations for foreign direct investment. And by maintaining CFIUS's effectiveness and efficiency, continuing our focus on the national security risk arising from the transaction, and working with our allies and partners on these issues, we'll be ready to recognize and confront new threats that will manifest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the Assistant Secretary has agreed to take some questions. So if you all could, anyone who wants to ask a question, put their hand up. We'll take a few at a time and then turn it over to him. No questions. <laughs> yes. Yeah, on the microphone. Can I ask, please introduce yourself, keep your questions brief, and one question only. I thank you for your speech. Um, my name is Sloan Rice, and I work for DHS. I'm wondering how much overlap you have with the IPO, with the investment program. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the IPO. Um, the, the, invest, the investment program that um, gives uh, the EB-5 visa for uh, foreign investors. So I guess the best way to, to answer that is we're looking at uh, inbound investment. So if a foreign company invests in a U.S. business and, and uh, meets the requirements of, of our jurisdiction, we can take a look at that for, for the national security risk. I'm not sure that, that the EB-5 program necessarily implicates that unless there's a foreign acquirer investing in that U.S. business. Other questions? Bob Donor. <laughs> uh, Bob Donor at the Atlantic Council. So um, Treasury CFIUS definition of critical technologies overlaps substantially with emerging and foundational technologies that the Commerce Department is working on, but those have not yet been defined. Uh, are you able to clear uh, transactions uh, covering issues where there's still a uncertainty as to definitions. We take a couple more questions. All right, over there. Hi, thank you. Uh, Kat Lucero, reporter for MLEX. Um, for uh, next month, can you elaborate more on your meetings with the EU and Japan in terms of um, how to, uh, in terms of the different kinds of CFIUS regimes? Okay, and maybe one more. Hi, uh, Stephanie Siegel with CSIS. Um, I heard you say right off the bat, uh, CFIUS's exclusive focus on national security, which has been the longstanding policy of Treasury and the US government. But increasingly, there's a lot of discussion about economic security being national security. So I'm wondering if you could comment on how Treasury and how CFIUS more generally views that link between economic security and national security. Over to you. So with respect to the first question on critical technology, the statute FIRMA defines critical technology and looks to, uh, CFIUS doesn't have a lot of latitude, if any, to, to define critical technology other than as the statute directs. Uh, it focuses on uh, items that are export controlled under a, a number of regimes and, and then has this new category of emerging and foundational technology. Obviously, we're looking to the Commerce Department to, to develop and designate um, emerging technologies, uh, and then they're immediately within uh, the jurisdiction of, of the new uh, FIRMA uh, statute. In terms of uh, our ability to clear, I'm not sure I understand the question, but to say to the extent we have jurisdiction and we see a national security risk, we're, we're, we're conducting business as usual. That is, does that help? So, I guess, so you, 
you work with the technologies that you have defined or define in a particular investigation as uh, important for national security, even though that definition may change over time. So I, I think I think the um, the way Firma was built was to allow it to be uh, nimble and adaptable to the changing techno uh, technology environment. And so to the extent there's a emerging technology or foundational technology that commerce through a rulemaking uh, identifies as something we need to protect, and then there's a foreign investment in that technology, we have the ability to look at it. Not the other question. Oh, or, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, I forgot. So, um, so with respect to, um, to, the, to the meeting uh, next month, I'll just say that uh, you know, we're heavily engaged with our allies and partners. I've spent a lot of time with meeting uh, with, uh, with other foreign governments on this issue. This is an opportunity, I think, from, from my perspective. CFIUS has 40 years of experience in this area. We have uh, one of the things we can share and export to our allies and partners is, uh, is how we do our work, right? How, um, how we do a risk analysis, what, um, uh, what best practices uh, uh, we bring to the table through the interagency process and how we uh, deconflict and work on, on identifying risk and, uh, and addressing that risk. So this is something that uh, is an opportunity to continue that dialogue. With respect to um, uh, uh, national security, economic security, I appreciate the question. Firma gives us, and and, and uh, FINSA, the Defense Production Act, gives us uh, a, a, a sort of uh, rubric to work from on what to consider in the course of our national security analysis. We're looking at the risk arising from the transaction and focused on how to ensure that technology isn't being misappropriated, data isn't being leveraged against uh, U.S. national security interests. So I think I think they're um, they're fairly distinct. A couple more. Sure. Okay. Other questions? What well, can you just wait one second? It's got a microphone. My name is uh, Zhu Hong, the Chinese Embassy. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, uh, balance of uh, national security and uh, economic uh, uh, benefits. Uh, everybody uh, admits that uh, uh, there's a really need to, to secure uh, the uh, national security. But on the other hand, uh, we can also uh, see some uh, trend of uh, something like abuse, uh, the using of those uh, national security. It hints some uh, economic benefits uh, from the United States. As uh, uh, President Trump uh, 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 indicated in his uh, tweet uh, on the uh, February uh, 2017, uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, 17, uh, a, uh, April 10th, I want to make it easy to do business with the United States. No difficult. Everyone in my administration is being so instructed with no excuse. The United States is open for business. So uh, my question is, uh, when you are doing your job, how do you balance these uh, two status? Thank you. Other questions? A couple more? In the back? Hi, Adam Richards from AFLAC. Uh, uh, recently, uh, CFIUS announced the uh, accepted foreign states for the firmer regime, and uh, Japan wasn't on the list. And just to, even though the, the, the countries that were, were on a sort of provisional basis, even though their regimes might not meet the, the requirements. Um, I was wondering maybe why that is and what would be the process for them being on that list if they, if they so, you know, if that's what they want. Maybe even broader than Japan, what are the prospects for other countries over time to be added? 
And I'd just like to add a question, too, because I've learned a lot about this in the past 24 hours. Can you comment a bit about um, your staffing in your office? Because it seems like it's growing exponentially. And I think that underscores the importance the administration is attaching to um, implementing this program in a very efficient and productive way. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll try and tackle all of these. Um, uh, as folks who have heard me make public comments before, uh, I, I say all the time the United States is open for investment. So, so uh, my remarks are consonant with, with the president's in that regard. We, you know, there are thousands of uh, business, tens of thousands of business transactions in the United States. CFIUS looks at roughly 250 a year. Uh, and so, and of those, the vast majority of those clear without mitigation or without any sort of um, uh, uh, ending uh, uh, ultimate impediment to the business transaction. So I'm confident that that we're um, we're maintaining that open investment environment and, and doing exactly what we should. With respect to national security, I'll just say it's not a balancing act. My job, my team's job, the committee's job is to eliminate national security risk. And so where we see it, we'll, we'll act to do so. Uh, with respect to um, accepted foreign states, um, you know, uh, I fully anticipate that uh, others may be considered and will be considered in the coming months and years to, uh, to be uh, included on that list. I'll just note that that accepted foreign state status only applies with respect to the new jurisdiction that CFIUS has with non-controlling non-passive investments and not with respect to its traditional jurisdiction. And then uh, with respect to staffing, uh, we're, we're definitely growing. We're, um, uh, if there are any resumes out there and folks <laughs> want to come and work for us, uh, I'm happy to, to take that resume. You know, we're, we've, we've grown probably um, quadrupled over the last two years that I've been there and I expect that, that number to continue to increase. Any further questions? Okay, then please join me in thanking <clears throat> Assistant Secretary Fetto for thank speaking you. with us this morning. Well, thank you very much. And I think um, Assistant Secretary Fetto has put a lot of issues on the table that we'll go into a little more detail here. We have an incredible panel here with us today. Um, and you have their bios on your seat, so I can just, just very briefly introduce everyone. Um, to my right is Hosek Lee Makiyama. Um, he's a dear friend and someone when I um, organize panels or where I'm traveling around the world and on a panel, I always want him with me. He's quite interesting. <laughs> There's a lot to say. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Not to raise expectations. He's the director of the European Center for International Political Economy, a think tank dedicated to the international economic policies that are, are of particular importance to Europe. And he's a leading expert on all things trade, investment, technology. So we're really fortunate to have him with us. Anne Saladin, um, to his right, um, she will offer kind of the practitioner's perspective for this discussion. She spent about 20 years at the Treasury Department's Office of the Assistant General Counsel for International Affairs, and she brings a wealth of experience about CFIUS matters and how FDI regulations are developed. She's now a partner with Hogan Lovells in town, where she helps clients, foreign and domestic, navigate the ins and outs of these regulations. To her right is Masaki Ishikawa. Um, he a um, long distinguished career at Japan's Ministry um, of Economy, Trade, and Industry. He assured me last night that our, our paths never crossed because he stayed out of the trade world. That was probably a good decision. <laughs> Um, and he really um, spent his career on um, U.S.-Japan cooperation on export con and, and on export controls and investment. And also, you did a stint at the Ministry of Defense as well. And then finally, um, but last but not least, Nigel Corey, um, who's with the in Information Technology and Innovation Foundation (ITIF). Um, many of you are familiar with ITF in town. They have deep expertise on the benefits and risks of foreign investment, on CFIUS reform, 
and multilateral coordination among allies. Um, prior to joining the think tank world, he worked for Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So did my boss, Kevin Rudd. <laughs> so welcome. Um, I thought we would then kick off the event. I'll ask some questions, but I urge you all to um, think of some as well. We'll turn this over to the audience with time. So first for Ishikawa-san, um, we referred to earlier the fact that Japan just recently updated its investment law and is now working to put regulations in place this spring. So we welcome your views on what drove this process. Mm -hmm. Um, a number of concerns have been raised. How is your government dealing with these concerns? And how have you coordinated or consulted with other countries going forward as you um, are putting this law and regulations into place? Um, thank you very much, Wendy. And uh, uh, regarding the first question, I think uh, there are two concerns that uh, led the Japan to amend the law, the name the Foreign Trade and the Foreign Currency Act last November. And just, the first uh, was the increasing concern about uh, 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 transfer of uh, uh, critical technologies from Japanese companies through uh, foreign investment. Uh, we understand that uh, advanced technologies de uh, developed by uh, private sectors would change uh, the global security environment uh, more drastic, drastically than never. And, uh, this made, uh, what should I say, Japanese uh, policymakers understand that uh, our investment uh, control should focus more on uh, access to critical technologies okay. and uh, sensitive data, in, a, in addition to con uh, traditional control over uh, uh, strategic se sectors such as uh, defense industries. And uh, in addition, uh, as you know, there are many companies heavily investing uh, research and development in advanced technologies in Japan. And uh, increased number, uh, increasing numbers of the, uh, them has experienced uh, in recent years uh, technology theft by uh, various means, measures, uh, such as uh, cyber or uh, what should I say, talent recruitment or uh, 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 what should I say, uh, influence uh, by uh, foreign investment. So, uh, so, so uh, the policymakers understood that uh, uh, the, techno the Japanese technology in private sector uh, are uh, clearly targeted. So again, this background, uh, the, uh, what should I say, the law, law was amended and, uh, the, and the covered investment is ex expanded. Uh, or uh, what shall I say, uh, the, low, uh, the low lowered uh, the threshold of covered uh, investment from 10% shareholding uh, to 1% shareholding. Wow. And uh, the second factor was uh, uh, that uh, uh, concerns that Japan could become a loophole among the developed uh, countries. Uh, we, uh, we know that uh, now uh, the farmer is uh, in full uh, uh, implementation, and also for the last uh, three years, uh, Germany, France, uh, UK, Australia has already, uh, I should say, strengthened uh, the uh, investment uh, control. So uh, I think uh, 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 Japanese policymakers uh, got, uh, uh, I should say, afraid that, uh, what should I say, prob problematic uh, investment could rush, uh, rush to uh, the Japanese market if they are uh, denied in, uh, by such countries. So this concern help uh, the, uh, the policy makers and the diet members understand that uh, uh, the amending the law is, is a very prior agenda. Uh, and so that's why uh, the law was, uh, what should I say, uh, uh, amended in last November. And uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the second question, I think the uh, uh, Japanese government has uh, repeatedly announced that uh, the amendment of the law aimed to uh, uh, further promotion uh, foreign direct investment conducive to uh, uh, economic growth while uh, preventing a leakage of critical uh, technology from uh, uh, Japanese companies. I think, uh, and my understanding is that uh, the Japanese government has been working uh, seriously to mitigate the burden, burden of investors 
And for example, the new law uh, uh, stipulates uh, exemption from prior notification. Uh, and uh, the government has already announced uh, to introduce some other burden mitigation measures. But at this moment, uh, detail of such uh, exemption and measures have not been have not become public yet. Uh, so, uh, and I guess or I suppose uh, that uh, the government will announce draft of uh, operational rules of the new law uh, probably in early next month. So, I think investors uh, uh, could. Uh, uh, I hope investors uh, will uh, uh, see uh, the draft rules closely, and uh, they could uh, submit uh, their views, comments to Japanese. Uh, authorities, and uh, uh, and as for the, some specific, uh, what should I say, measures uh, regarding exemption, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, the, the government is going to enable investors to use exemption if the investments are, are out of security concern, and uh, as what should I say, typical uh, example uh, is uh, uh, in, uh, portfolio investment by uh, foreign. Uh, uh, financial institutions. And uh, la yesterday, the newspaper said that uh, uh, the Japanese government is going to uh, I say, expand the coverage of uh, uh, such exemption. But uh, still, it's, uh, the detail is uh, unclear at this moment. And uh, another uh, major uh, to uh, uh, mitigate wow. uh, the burden of investors is, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, is that the government is going to publish the list uh, of, uh, uh, what should I say, list of listed companies covering all 3,700 3, companies. And that ca uh, the list will uh, classify uh, uh, the all listed companies into three groups. The first group is uh, companies of uh, uh, companies not under the regulation, so you can be relaxed. And the second uh, 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 group is companies under regulation, and at the same time, you can uh, use uh, uh, exemption in investing in uh, 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 these com companies. And the third com uh, group is the companies under uh, regulation, and you cannot use exemption. And so uh, this, uh, if uh, I think this list could uh, help investors uh, deal with uh, uh, the procedures more easily. And uh, regarding the third question, um, I think uh, many developed countries, including Japan uh, and the US, uh, has uh, already, uh, uh, what should I say, strengthened the, the what should I say, regulation. I think it's amazing uh, uh, development. But I think we have to uh, uh, work harder to stop a loophole among developed countries. Uh, since I think of the, what should I say, um, uh, regulations uh, of uh, these countries are, uh, what should I say, very much di uh, uh, to some extent different from country to country. So we have to uh, promote uh, uh, coordination and cooperation in uh, implementing uh, these uh, 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 regulations. So in this regard, uh, the, the um, Japanese amended law uh, includes a new article setting uh, procedures uh, in which Japanese authorities can exchange more sensitive information on investment control with uh, uh, foreign counterparts. I hope this, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, article will help uh, uh, Japan Play a, uh, play a more important role in promoting uh, international cooperation. Thank well, thank you very much, much for that um, comprehensive overview. If I can now turn to Hosek and ask you now to kind of give us the state of play in Europe. I know from my old days, um, the, Europe, the European Commission did not have confidence in the investment area. It seems now that they've gotten some confidence, but. Um, and they've come up with a new kind of screening mechanism for information sharing, but maybe you can kind of shed more light on that and give us more a sense what's going on among the member states and how many member states have um, investment screening regimes in place, how many don't, and what does this mean? Well, you're absolutely right. In five right. minutes. Yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Now, investment screening has always been 
Well, actually, investment overall has been always been disjointed in Europe. It's a policy area that has been extremely difficult because we have division of competences. On one hand, FDI is actually a European EU level competency decided by Brussels. But on the other hand, well, um, national security is exempted from all EU cooperation. So in other words, as the second you enter into the word screening, it goes back to the member states. And as exactly as you're saying, actually only 15 out of 27 and a half member states actually have a screening to begin with. And that puts it actually a little bit in an awkward situation. So most of them, the, um, the 12 remaining countries that doesn't actually even have an investment screening are mostly in Eastern Europe. And also the, uh, the Mediterranean so-called investment yeah, uh, hubs, let's call them that. But also countries like Ireland and uh, Belgium, who otherwise probably wouldn't have much investment screening, uh, sorry, uh, otherwise much FDI. And I think that kind of is a very important point. At one point, we have identified a few countries, including uh, China, as a systemic rival. But on the other hand, we have to recognize that actually inward FDI is just 0.3% of our GDP. That's one-fifth of the United States. I know you're all thinking beggars cannot be choosers, but it's not really that simple. But, uh, for example, if you look at countries in the periphery, it's not that easy to attract the investment unless it's actually domestic and European. And so, in that sense, there is an um, almost like an undertone of the constant problem where actually the problem, for example, vis-a-vis -vis China, is not necessarily the fact that China invests in Europe. It's actually the fact that China invests more in its own Asian region or even in the United States than it invests in Europe. So you can see, for example, the, uh, the portfolios of many of the Chinese investment vehicles. Uh, Europe accounts for less than 20% in the most cases. It's mostly in the United States and in Asia. So with that, actually, I think the big change came uh, a couple of years ago when uh, a couple of strategic acquirements have been made by uh, Chinese companies. One called Media, who tried to acquire KUKA, which is a major uh, robot, uh, well, uh, one of the leading robotics firm, but as well as certain uh, bulk purchases of stocks, for example, in major companies like Daimler, which set off actually a new wave of national investment screening reforms. So for example, Germany, what they did was they cut the threshold from 25% to 10% for mandatory uh, investment screening process. France did the same thing. And also they, at the same time, they expanded the area of uh, mandatory um, screening into uh, mostly into ICT, AI, and network uh, equipment and the 5G. So we have seen a development on a member state level saying we have to look into this. And actually one of the good examples we can see is France has gone pretty far, not just by screening the investment and giving the government a prior authorization, but also taking the right to take away voting rights in case there is an actually really strategic issue. And we even see uh, assets. And at the same time, as I was saying before, there is also a, a, there is a reason why we have now an EU-wide regulation on top of the na national ones. So one of the uh, big uh, problems for the member states has been that if you allow an investment, oh, sorry, if you block an investment, for example, in Germany, uh, a hostile country could easily go to, for example, <coughs> my home country, Sweden, and acquire the competitor. And in one sense, if you have the same strategic objective, you would say that's become a problem. But in the case of Europe, I think the, the biggest problem is the fact that if, for example, Germany wants to, you know, decides to walk away from a deal with the Chinese, they don't want anyone else to make money out of China. It's that simple. And so internal competition, as you find in a family like Europe, is uh, becoming evident. So this is the reason why we have now an FDI regulation in the EU uh, since last year. And to put it very, very simply, uh, it doesn't actually require the EU member state to even have an FDI screening. But if you do, it has to be transparent and non-discriminatory. And it gives you the peer review right to your neighbor countries and say, we may have an issue with this. And you, may, uh, you must have some kind of transparency. But you can also ask yourself how effective it's going to be, because it's all under national law, which basically means that even if you take your neighbor country into court, there is no legal basis for you to win, even if you have a real objection 
that you're, uh, there has been an FDI investment in your neighboring country that you, you, where your, your own national, uh, uh, national strategic interests may be a threat. So um, at the same time, uh, one feature of the EU regulation that probably did the beginning of a bigger development we might see in the coming decade is the fact that uh, the Commission, the European Commission with their joint executive has taken the right to express concern when there is a union-wide interest. So what does it mean? It's a few projects, mostly in, for example, SatNav, um, physical and the data infrastructure. And uh, in those cases, actually, the commission could step in and offer an opinion. I think the learning, if I take this putting together, uh, what it means in terms of working with a region like Europe and the European cooperation, is the fact that, first of all, you have to still deal with the member states. And that comes very naturally. For example, we have discussion, for example, around semiconductors and the strategic importance of, uh, well, computing and uh, semiconductors. You don't have to speak to Hungary. You don't have to speak to every country in the EU, member, uh, amongst the EU27. You only need to speak to two, Netherlands and Germany. It does not necessarily make sense to bring EU in. Uh, at the same time, there is a backside to this, which is, of course, that some of the countries, uh, I mentioned Hungary before, has issued a diplomatic immunity to Russian investors, to their investment bank, and which basically means that they can't be investigated. So we are taking really, really disparate approaches. But at the same time, um, just a final couple of points that I'd like to make, and in terms of working with Europe, another problem that comes up, especially when we compare with the, the reforms we've seen in the United States and Japan, is that because of the way Europe works, it's extremely legalistic. It's not dynamic, which basically means that everything has to be written down. The scope must be precise, which makes it extremely difficult to work with an entity like Europe in a very evolving issue like investment and uh, um, in uh, new areas uh, like technology. And the second point, and, uh, which will be my last, which is that EU has very often very poor intelligence when it comes to investment screening. That, what I will very often say is that we do a lot of investment screening, perhaps in the member states, but we don't do investor screening because we don't necessarily know who we are dealing with. And if you add the inclination that you rather pass an FDI a transaction simply because of the fact that you need the jobs, it puts you in a really, really difficult position. Thanks. There's a lot to chew on. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions, follow up. Um, Anne, let me turn to you um, and I ask you, you as a longtime um, 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 employee at the Treasury Department working on these issues, what surprised you the most in the new firma regulations just overall? And I'd also be interested in your take on um, the question that was asked by someone in the back earlier, the fact that it, it, um, three, I believe it's three countries were, were given some kind of exemption status from FIRMA. Mm -hmm. what, is that, what does that mean? Can you put a little more meat on the bones than, um, than Assistant Secretary Beto shared with us? What's your perspective on that? And do you think there's prospects for additional countries um, um, being added? And then finally, um, and Assistant Secretary Fedo, he, he um, referred to the, the new firm of regulations as kind of being a, gener you know, a generation change. Um, and I'd be interested in your views. Do you think we're going to wait another generation to see firm of regulations updated again? Or do you see this more as an evolving process? Excellent questions. Thank you, Wendy, for, for uh, inviting me on this panel. And also uh, glad to see some familiar faces out there. Um, I think. Maybe I can walk through a couple of other aspects and in the, in the course of that address those questions more specifically. Um, but I think it's probably an understatement to say that, um, that FIRMA was an ambitious effort. Um, and we're, we're now in the phase where we're going to see with the new regulations how it's implemented. And I think um, basically, uh, in my own view, it was something that was needed to fill the gaps uh, in, the, in the old regulation. Um, and maybe to give a little context as to why that is, I will you know, just take a minute to review the historical context for CFIUS. Um, it was established in 1975 uh, by executive order. 
and it was uh, basically geared to deal with, at that time, the accumulation of dollars by OPEC and the fear that there would be some purchases in the U.S. to the detriment of U.S. national security. Then you go to uh, 1988, you have the Exxon Florio Amendment, which basically was in response to Japanese investment at that time. Then you fast forward, it's just very brief, then you fast forward 2007, 2008, and you have a new uh, structure of the law, uh, FINSA at the time, which was in response to Dubai ports and also uh, to the events of September 11th. So what you see in that law is a focus on critical infrastructure, which retain is retained today. Um, so what has happened since that time is that there's been a rather fundamental change in the landscape for investments. And the single largest change, of course, has been the rise of China as an investment, as an investor in the U.S. and other places. Um, also, other changes that took place are ones that um, Assistant Secretary Fedo uh, referenced this morning is that there's increasingly um, an interconnectedness between commercial and military applications for technologies. So it's not hard to uh, imagine at this stage with that major change that this would be the reason for another major change at this time. In, and, and that has basically generated FIRMA. Um, and it is, as Assistant Secretary uh, Fedo mentioned, the most significant overhaul of the, uh, of the statute in, in 30 years. And it was by, passed by a strong bipartisan uh, effort. So um, I think Treasury, personally, and Congress deserve a lot of credit, and, uh, and, and also the other CFIUS agencies, for putting together a set of rules which basically preserves the traditional framework, uh, which is premised upon control of a US business by a foreign person, um, but also drills down and, and, and really tries to attack certain areas that were of concern. And those, you will see in the, in the law that those are companies that deal with critical infrastructure, personal data, and critical technologies. So what you see is a regime that basically relies on the traditional framework, but also uh, tries to fill those gaps by requiring, mm. for example, mandatory filings in the case of critical technology, businesses, et cetera. Um, I think the other important thing to mention about FIRMA is that it also provides a new mechanism for benign investments to get through rather quickly. So we now have a new short form declaration whereby uh, investments that from a, an acquirer, for example, that may be uh, relatively benign can, can uh, can file those and potentially get out in a shorter period of time. Um, to some extent, this codifies the practices that have been at CFIUS over many years, heightened scrutiny for certain countries, and then also expedited treatment. But now with FIRMA, uh, there is the mechanism, the more formal mechanism to deal with that. Um, the new framework remains largely voluntary, although there are some areas in which it is mandatory. And I guess at the end of the day, when you think about um, how to assess it, you think about whether or not you know, an appropriate balance has been achieved mm -hmm. between the protection of national security and also open, encouraging open investment. And I would say on that question that it's too soon to tell, in my view, um, I think we're going to need to see how the regulations are interpreted and in particular, whether or not there is, um, how enforcement is going to be carried out. We see in recent days um, more resources uh, allocated from FIRMA that have been uh, devoted towards being able to take a look at transactions that may have closed but present national security considerations that are then brought in for review by the committee. Um, and we also know that additional resources under FIRMA have been, uh, have been devoted to uh, basically rearranging or re reorganizing the Office of Investment Security such that there is a group that's specifically focused on trying to, to assess whether or not there are transactions that have closed that may be problematic. Um, and some of you may be aware that the first ever penalties have been assessed um, in, in connection with uh, the violation of a mitigation agreement, and, and then also quite recently, the violation of an interim order. So we'll see how that goes, because I think that will inform, to, it will be a particularly important factor in assessing the balance between open investment uh, and uh, protection of national security. Um, Wendy, you asked about the three states that were, were identified. So to me, this is one of the more remarkable aspects of the this law. Was, this was um, the UK, Canada. UK, Canada, and Australia, right? Yeah. 
for the first time ever, CFIUS, the CFIUS legal framework has identified states that can receive prefer preferential treatment. And so that in itself is a novelty. <clears throat> Um, Treasury said in its in the regulations that these countries were chosen because of their robust intelligence sharing and defense industrial base integration mechanisms with the U.S. And of course, those countries are part of the Five Eyes intelligence sharing uh, regime. Um, I also think that these, my own view is that these countries were chosen because they are have long been filers with CFIUS, and so there's a relative level of comfort with acquirers from those countries. Uh, that may or may not exist for, for other in other situations. Um, so the way the framework works for those countries, UK, Australia, uh, and Canada to remain as accepted foreign states, they will have to there will have to be a determination in 2022 about and basically that will involve the robustness robustness of those states' investment screening mechanisms. And it's quite interesting in the regulations, there is a there is a section detailed factors for determinations under this. Uh, so at least for now, it's probably not exhaustive. These are the kinds of criteria that Treasury is going to look at in terms of remaining uh, de making that kind of determination. But I think what this two year period does is really give time for Treasury to to think about uh, develop processes uh, for how it will affect this kind of thing. And also, interestingly enough, you, you can imagine this is a kind of a carrot for uh, countries to upgrade their investment uh, screening process, making it into something of a multilateral effort. Um, I want to make one point is that once, if you are from an accepted foreign state, that does not necessarily mean you get expedited treatment. What you have to do then is to meet a certain set of criteria, but requirers from those states have to meet a certain additional set of criteria, uh, which are, I think in some respects, could be quite onerous. So we'll see, we'll see how that, uh, that turns out. These are requirements that relate to, for example, board nationalities, et cetera. Um, so we'll see how, how that plays out. And then once you get to be an accepted, uh, an accepted investor, um, even then one has to look at what benefits that brings you. Um, I think Assistant Secretary Fedo mentioned that it brings you benefits in, the con in connection with uh, the non-controlling investments and jurisdiction over them. But so at the end of the day, I think we'll have to see how that, how that so works. So it's not a blanket exception. It's not a blanket exception, mm -hmm. right, exactly. Um, Maybe just a few more remarks, and then I can. Okay. So, um, what can we? Thing people ask, but you know, Wendy, you asked, what can we learn from efforts um, to revise these regulations? And I think a couple of things in connection with FIRMA. One is that it's very important to consult the business community. Uh, I think there was an uh, you know an effort made under FIRMA to do that, and the and the regulations have benefited from that. And then I think the second lesson is that. Um, I look at this structure now uh, with FIRMA and see that it's a document or an, a, a, a set of rules mm. that will be able to be updated on a regular basis. And that was not the case with the prior regime, uh, which had to be overhauled. But now we see, for example, in the accepted foreign state area, that there will be changes. And I think that that will be very important to being able to address evolving national security concerns as we go forward. Good, thank you. So Nigel, let me turn to you. We've heard um, the US perspective, <coughs> Japan perspective, your perspective. Um, I think all three speak speakers who've addressed this, they've talked about at least at a minimum consultation among the importance of consultation among like-minded countries. Um, but my question for you, can you somehow kind of you know, tie this together? What are the prospects for more than just consultation, but more for coordination or cooperation, um, and you know, are there any existing venues like the OECD or the G7 or the G20 that could play a role in this? And how do you see this evolving? Uh, uh, firstly, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here, Wendy. Uh, it's been really interesting to get the various sort of uh, perspectives and background and a sec uh, Assistant Secretary Fedo's remarks to sort of give us the context to look at how, how do we look at this issue evolving internationally and really serious efforts to work together and coordinate investment screening at the international level are really at the early stages. And this will no doubt intensify as, as, as everyone sort of uh, alluded to, but it'll likely be on a bilateral or a small group basis. But it's 
it's really important to emphasise here that this cooperation will come off the back of uh, a wide range of domestic reforms in that the OECD notes that nine of the 10 largest economies and over a dozen of its other 62 member economies have either enacted or made, ch made changes to their investment sort of screening regimes over the last four or five years, which is a huge sort of change. And this global reaction amounts to essentially a, a collective indictment of China's predatory, non-reciprocal uh, uh, economic policies in how state-funded and directed investment from either SOEs or supposedly private firms have taken advantage of open foreign sort of investment frameworks to target firms with sensitive data, critical technology and critical infrastructure. However, as the Assistant Secretary sort of pointed towards, the success of these domestic changes will depend in part on how well they work together as we've seen Chinese-backed firms have deflected from uh, sort of hard targets to soft targets over the last four or five years. And so thus far at the international level, the focal point for broad general discussions has largely been at the OECD, which has been working on these issues for over 10 years. Uh, they did their first comparative study of investment regimes uh, in 2016. Uh, they host periodic meetings uh, about national security and investment screening, uh, most recently in November of last year. Uh, also at the request of the G20, the OECD and the UN Conference on Trade and Development have put out uh, periodic reports on uh, changes in investment screening uh, regimes, which they did in, last, did in March uh, of last year. However, actual outcomes at the OECD and G20 are limited to sort of a broad principles in part due to the countries involved in that China is involved, obviously, at the G20 and at these discussions at the OECD. Uh, the best that the G20 has done is um, uh, 2016, uh, they agreed to the adoption of the non-binding guiding principles for global investment policy making. And while these sort of broad general discussions are sort of helpful, they're not fast enough, nor specific or adaptable enough nor geared for the type of information exchanges and cooperation that's really needed for countries to sort of react to, to the, the way that Chinese uh, state funded sort of Chinese firms are going about acquiring tech uh, for non-market purposes. Uh, so, but so looking ahead, what, what can we expect in that effective coordinated action on foreign investment screening will likely happen bilaterally or between small groups of like-minded countries as it depends on a few key things. A, a shared view uh, of the threat posed by Ch what we call Chinese innovation mercantilism and the investment associated with that. It depends on case-by-case -case assessments. And it also depends on the sharing of confidential commercial information and intelligence, which is based on both formal uh, legal protections and understandings about how that information will be used and protected, uh, but also because this information is exchanged on the basis of trust. And so a central problem, as Hosuk mentioned, especially in Europe, is that not every country views this investment the same way. Uh, Japan, the United States, Australia are similarly aligned. Uh, uh, meanwhile, Europe is catching up, but it's not uniform. Um, so thus far, the uh, the trilateral framework, which I think is, I presume it's under that rubric that the Assistant Secretary was talking about the meeting next month, which is the US, Japan and the EU, is perhaps the best concrete example we have of a shared view and coordinated action in that the three trade ministers have made repeated references to cooperation on investment review mechanisms and they've welcomed deepening cooperation uh, between relevant authorities. Uh, I put out a report uh, last month on how this should be a, a, a basis for a broader agenda. There's also been talk of the Five Eyes, which is another potential sort of model for co coordination uh, between the US, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the UK, um, but it's hardly replicable or, or adaptable. And so what this leads us with in a best case scenario is a small group of like-minded countries who are home to the advanced technology firms that China has identified it wants to acquire by hook or by crook as a part of its strategic development plans, which is Australia, Canada, the US, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and parts of Europe, 
uh, sort of working together to get a, a better detailed picture of foreign investors of concerns, their intentions and the potential impact on the host, as well as third countries and uh, different sectors. And so whatever the grouping, however this plays out over the next few years as, as we move from sort of reforms to enforcement to cooperation, we think there should be a few core features that were put into sort of our past work on this for effective international cooperation. And that's consistent and protected information exchanges as only where information is, is available to peers can regulatory alignment actually work. Uh, Hosuk sort of mentioned this uh, in terms of uh, investment screening in the EU. Uh, the, uh, uh, the US, uh, EU and Japan have all made explicit mentions to this factor in their own domestic efforts. Furthermore, while investment screening is on a case by case basis, these countries would benefit from annual or semi-annual reports on transactions to identify trends as to where Chinese firms are going and what they're going for. Uh, it also, also should include a confidential feedback mechanism so that third countries to, could feed into the transaction reviews in these countries, as well as other countries should also be able to recognise the review decision undertaken by other countries uh, uh, as they do their own sort of reviews. Uh, in closing, uh, I think what it'll be interesting to see, as, as the Assistant Secretary pointed to, there's obviously this specific lever within CFIUS to, uh, to incentivize countries to align with the US approach. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that, combined with these various domestic efforts, come together uh, uh, on the, for the basis of closer uh, alignment and cooperation and information exchange as these countries um, seek to work together in specific sort of technology and, and advanced sort of tech sectors. I might add just a point to that, which is that um, it's really important because FIRMA put in place the uh, provisions that will allow for this information sharing in certain circumstances. Previously, that had not been permitted by the statute for confidentiality reasons. So this is a very large change. Hmm. Open the floor then. <clears throat> Questions? Yeah. Karen. I'm Karen Sutter with Congressional Research Service, and thank you for an excellent panel. I wanted to come back to a point that, Wendy, you made in the very beginning about the lessons each country's system can learn from one another. And so what I would be interested in you to respond to the following. What I heard is that in FIRMA, there are now provisions for coverage uh, for non-passive, non-controlling but those are dependent on definitions set by the Department of Commerce that have not yet been forthcoming. In Japan, they have, there's been a lowering of the threshold to 1%. There's been a look at research and development, but there's an area of exemptions. Uh, you know, I wonder how that would apply, for example, to venture capital, uh, financial services, consortium investments. In Europe, uh, France has defined artificial intelligence are there lessons there as countries are trying to define emerging technologies? The EU also now has the capacity to look at issues of aggregation. How does investment suddenly reach a tipping point across countries, across jurisdictions that become a risk to national security? Um, so just be interested in your views, how we can be learning from one another. Thank you. We take a few more. Other questions? Thanks, um, and thanks for an excellent panel. I have questions actually for all of you, but I'll, I'll limit myself to one. And, and following up on my question on kind of the link between economic security and national security, Nigel, you kind of got at this with your description of Chinese innovation mercantilism, which is different, I think, than what the Assistant Secretary described. So I'm wondering, one, if you could kind of react to your interpretation of his narrow scoping limited to national security. And then for the others, for the other regions we've been talking about, how those mechanisms would actually distinguish or treat this idea of, of mercantilism as being a motivation for screening and investment. There was one more question near you, someone up there. Oh, is that Maria? Uh, yes, Mireya Solis from Brookings, a question for uh, Ishikawa-san. Uh, with the new revision to the foreign investment law, there has really vocal uh, pushback from the foreign investor community, not Chinese SOEs, but actually 
Western firms who um, are concerned that these might compromise Japan's efforts at corporate governance and could also undermine the effort to bring uh, foreign investment and that the uh, Japanese government may not meet the target of doubling inflows of foreign direct investment. So um, I imagine that these exemptions are geared towards assuring those concerns, but um, what could else could the Japanese government do in order to uh, make sure that foreign investment in Japan does not dry up and that there is not a skepticism about the resilience of corporate governance uh, reforms? Okay, so we have three questions. The first about lessons learned and, um, from each country and different countries as they put together these regimes. The second, again, about the intersection between economic and national security. And finally, a specific question on Japan and concerns of the U.S. business community. So I look to the panel. Nigel? Yeah, I, I, I might as well start things off. <laughs> uh, I'll sort of uh, respond to sort of merging the two. In terms of key lessons and the, the, the crossover, one of the key lessons that we would suggest is that mm -hmm. investment screening is only one part, should only be one part of a country's broader response to, to what we see as Chinese innovation mercantilism. And in this regard, it's obviously uh, primarily focused as, as to how it crosses over with national security. We would argue that it should uh, take into uh, consideration a broader sort of uh, lens uh, as it relates to economic security. And I'll note here that my home country of Australia, they don't sort of review foreign investment based on national security. They review it on national interest. And so uh, we think that there's a case to be made that it's obviously uh, critical that uh, CFIUS uh, uh, be used to protect, obviously, uh, technologies that are critical to the uh, uh, industrial base for, uh, for defence and national security purposes, but that there are core sort of innovation intensive sectors which uh, often are also related in the defence industrial base, but are actually uh, more broadly critical uh, to the, the, the competitiveness and the innovation of the US economy that if lost, once lost, uh, is nearly impossible to get back. And especially if it's lost not through natural competitive, uh, fair market-based sort of competition, but due to sort of state-directed, distorted sort of actions. So we think that that CFIUS is, is one part, should just be one part of a broader response to the types of sort of uh, innovation mercantilism policies that we've been long sort of advocating the US and others need to provide a stronger response to. Um, and so it, that's one of the key lessons that we say is that innovation, uh, investment screening is only one tool of many. Countries need to realise how they're affected uh, uh, through uh, all these various ways. Uh, other key lessons is uh, in terms of the types of investment, which I think firmer, like in terms of both controlling and non-controlling investments, the nature of, of, of how uh, tech, this key technologies or national security related sort of technologies have fallen uh, into the hands of other countries has changed. And so uh, that's a key part. The, the, the other key lesson that I just want to reiterate again is on information exchange. And to Hosek's point, a key part of that is on um, uh, investor transparency in terms of who is the actual body or actor uh, it's sort of undertaking this transaction. Who is behind the curtain? Because we have seen cases whereby uh, 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 funds provided by the Chinese government have been sort of put through numerous cutouts into some sort of buyout fund or some other uh, entity to undertake a transaction that is clearly related to their state-directed goals. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, regarding uh, the first question or uh, a lesson from Japanese experience, I think uh, um, in my view, my, one of the biggest uh, challenge to make uh, regulation work efficiently and effectively is, uh, uh, is how to, what should I say, how to get uh, agencies equipped with uh, uh, good information and uh, uh, the knowledges about the latest development of technologies. Uh, as you know, uh, now in recent years, uh, new concepts such as emerging technologies or foundational technology uh, in, have been introduced. But uh, it's a little bit, uh, what should I say, uh, difficult to define clearly. 
So I think uh, in under such uh, situation, uh, uh, what should I say, agent, uh, uh, authorities tend to uh, try to catch all uh, mm. investment. So in order to uh, prioritize uh, their what should I say, target, I think uh, uh, it is very important for the government to uh, get uh, authorities equipped with uh, good knowledge or uh, information or intelligence about uh, uh, technologies and in that sense, it is, uh, what should I say, very diff uh, important for uh, the like-minded countries to share such uh, information and intelligence with each other. But in order to do so, I think uh, the, uh, we have to do what we have to do first is to uh, create a kind of a framework in which um, like-minded countries can share uh, the information and uh, uh, what should I say, good. The information security, and uh, uh, and regarding the second question about how we can the Japanese go uh, Japanese government can address the concern from the foreign investors, I think uh, of course it's a very uh, important, uh, 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 significant question, and uh, um, my understanding is that uh, the new role uh, is focusing on how investors can access. Uh, to the critical technologies. And, uh, and I think uh, this approach uh, under the new law is uh, similar to, uh, to, what should I say, significantly similar to uh, the uh, approach taken by the firma and the firma uh, about uh, investment in a TID business. And uh, also I want to say that uh, um, uh, the new law has, uh, what should I say, uh, uh, expanded the, the scope of regulation, but the, uh, the criteria for uh, raving investment is not changed and will not be changed. So I think the review will be done uh, strictly, strictly from the viewpoint of uh, national security. And uh, also, uh, what should I say, um, um, uh, regarding uh, the uh, track record of implementation, for last uh, 20 years, the Japanese authorities uh, accept, have accepted uh, more than 7,000 uh, um, applications, but uh, only one case was uh, ordered to suspend. So I think this kind of uh, way of uh, implementation will not be changed, changed under the new law. But anyway, so I think, uh, as I said, uh, as the Japanese government is going to introduce uh, 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 exemption scheme for uh, uh, notification or something like that. So I think, uh, I hope uh, these, uh, what should I say, uh, burden mitigation uh, measures will help, really help uh, foreign investors. We're going to need to close soon, so let me just turn to our other two panelists for any parting comments they want to make or respond to any of the questions that were put on the floor. Yeah, sure. I would just say that um, you asked about lessons learned. I would say we're going to learn a lot more lessons, um, <laughs> for one. And then I would just say to remind people that CFIUS is a transaction-by-transaction transaction review process. It does not consider overall, its mandate is not to consider overall sort of industrial policy. And it's an exact, it's not, um, it's an inexact tool for doing so. So I think really what I hope is that the focus remains on national security and that it is on a transaction by transaction basis. Mm -hmm. So I'll conflate the two questions I think I received. Uh, one is about the learnings from Europe. And I think in a way, Europe is a microcosm of the trilateral or any OECD cooperation we can make. And it really shows how difficult it is with investment screening. Because simply put, it's a national competence and it's also very territorial. Yeah, you can have information exchange, you can have transparency, but you will never, ever have enforcement. So, for example, if Ireland, that, who doesn't even have investment screening, who would sell out all their ports in North Korea, just to take an example, and UK would have a little bit of problem with it, they would actually have to go to an Irish court and say, hey, we have a problem. Sorry, Irish rules apply. You know, this is not going to work. So in that sense, th there's always going to be different objectives. And if you have different objectives, it's impossible to have a common strategy. So that's my first point. But also in terms of circumvention, how complex it has become. 
we have only touched upon the, um, the problems with, for example, the con export controls. And we had several cases in Europe where um, a potentially hostile country were not actually allowed to acquire a company, so they just licensed it. They just licensed the technology from the competitor. Not a, not a problem at all. So you need to have similarity. Basically, they have to be coherent, the, these two pillars. And also in terms of, we also know how quick capital is. And if I look at the, the second largest investor in Europe, it's basically the Caribbean islands. <laughs> You know, and so which basically means that you know you have to see what's actually behind that. And in the case of EU, it's really, really simple to just set up house in Belgium, and then you become an EU member state entity, and you can invest in France, no problem at all. Then you basically bypass everything by just entering into another country first, because we are not allowed to discriminate another EU member state. It's national treatment for another EU member. And the final point on the mercantilism that I would like to do is, you have to look at it also a little bit of a double-edged sword. Yes, it is true that we have really woken up AI, quantum computing, and also a lot of personal information that is really sensitive to European countries have become basically a strategic national interest. But at the same time, if you look at the German law, they don't just look at the ICT and the cloud technologies, they're also looking at social media. And why? The question is, if you know, a Silicon Valley company wants to take over a German social media, why on earth they would do that, I don't know. That would actually come into a problem. And there was actually a real case like this in France. Um, there is a French YouTube equivalent called uh, Daily Motion. It's mostly pirated Hollywood TV programs, a little bit of bad porn, but basically it is, um, it is a very harmless entity that Microsoft tried to buy, and actually the, uh, the French government blocked it. Uh, a decade and a half ago, um, uh, there was an internal EU merger potentially in Derry, and the French government blocked it because it was a strategic national interest. We had a much narrower scope of what actually strategic equipment was in those days. But for France, it was basically nuclear warheads and stra strawberry flavored yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> um, I think we've had a really lively discussion here. And I think we could probably go on for a few more hours, but we're not going to do that. Um, so just join me in thanking the panel for this excellent discussion and feel free to approach some panelists after if you have further questions. Thank you. Thank you.